Good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. We're thankful that you are here. A few quick announcements. First is this. If you're in the leadership slash elder training, we're going to meet at my house this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Don't forget. Also, I'd like to thank everyone for the kind words and the kind cards yesterday. Much appreciated. And also to thank Nick and Laura for their kind hospitality to us as a church. I don't know where you... There you are, Nick. Thank you, guys. We really appreciate it. Kelly, would you come and read a call to worship? Good morning. Brent asked me to read uh, Psalm 16, um, and I, I, I tried to dig into it a little bit yesterday and last night, uh, kind of some substance behind it, and it's, it was probably a song or some kind of melody, uh, and it's, it's subtitled, You Will Not Abandon My Soul. <clears throat> Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As far the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out, or take their names on my lips. <clears throat> the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. That's a good part right there. <laughs> I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to show or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you, God, for this day. We want to thank you, Lord, for your blessings already, Father. Father, we just now come to you humbled hearts, Father. Open minds, Father, that we would receive your word and your truth as we truly come and partake in worship. God, we just pray, Lord, that you be with the music. Father, we pray, Lord, that uh, the songs that be sung today will be pleasing to your ears, God. It, it would be recognized as an attempt just to rejoice in your love. Thank you for that security in your love. Father, we just pray, God, that you uh, anoint Brent as he stands before this congregation today, Father. Uh, you preach him. You touch his lips. Father, you just preach the words. Father, you just have us to hear the message that you bring forth today. We ask all these things in your holy, sweet name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
and my Redeemer. Gracious Savior of my ruined life, my guilt and cross laid on your shoulders. telling Alicia last night as we went home, I wish the church could do something like that every other month. <laughs> it's just fun to hang out and fellowship with you folks. So Brent asked me to read Colossians 1, uh, 28 through 2, 3. In him, we we, in him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toll, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the rich riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again that you've allowed us to, to gather this morning. I'm thankful for each and every one who has took the time and have the desire of their hearts to, to come here and worship you. We're thankful that we can do that in freedom. And I ask this morning, Lord, that you would be with Brent, that you would be with Michael and Christian, Lord, as they preach. I'm thankful that you have uh, blessed our church with, with men that can... Uh, preach the truth of your word and rightly divide it, Lord. I pray that you continue to bless them and use them, and I pray that you would do so this morning. I pray, Lord, that everything that's said and done in this service this morning would bring glory to your name, and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand again and sing, There is a Fountain.
police beam stammering tongue lies silent in the grave. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to this about four or five weeks ago. Maybe you remember it.
Let's pray. Now, Father, we come to you this morning uh, with grateful hearts and glad hearts. And we are thankful for the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. When he comes to us and he says, you do stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have been saved. You are being saved. You will be saved. We thank you for this good news that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And we're thankful that our sin has been taken away through his sacrificial death in our place on the cross of Calvary. We thank you that whereas we had no righteousness that could make the grade on the last day that we have been clothed with the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're thankful that one day soon uh, we will have a resurrection body. We will see him face to face. We will worship with joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. And we just thank you uh, that we have a hope and a future on account of what Jesus has done. Thank you for the great mercy that you have shown to those of us who know you this morning, Father. We just praise you for being our great God and Savior. We thank you for the word. We want to ask uh, that as we get into the word, that you'd open up our hearts and our minds and our understanding. Help us to see things that we heretofore have not seen. Uh, help us to uh, not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. As we listen, give us repentant hearts. Uh, give us hearts that are soft and malleable. Uh, Holy Spirit, help us to see what you've made us to be as the body of Christ. And, and we're thankful that when you saved us, you didn't just save us to be individual, isolated Christians, but you made us part of your body. Thank you so much for that. Help us to love your body and to be faithful members of your body. I pray, Lord, for myself. I pray, Lord, that you'd forgive me of all my sins. I uh, thank you that you are quick to forgive those who look to your son. I look to him now. Pray, Lord, that you would endue me with power from on high so that I could speak as one speaking the very words of God. Uh, pray, Lord, that I would not say anything that would bring reproach to your name, but that, Lord, I would speak the truth in love even now. Continue to build your church. Uh, thank you for the good things that you have in store for us here at Grace Bible Church. We love you and we praise you for your gentleness, your steadfast love, and your mercy in our lives. Amen. Huh? Okay, just wondering, just wondering if that was my brain doing that or if that was the sound system. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of hollow space in my head, and so sometimes things just ring around in there and bounce. Uh, <laughs> I'm deficient in gray matter. Okay, Ephesians 4. We're going to pick up in verse 7 and go down through verse 16. Ephesians has a lot to say about the church, and Paul is continuing to hammer away at the church, that we might have a right understanding of who we are as Christians, what the body of Christ is, how a church is supposed to operate. Uh, church, being part of the body of Christ, is right at the center of a true Christian life. And in verse 7, Paul says this, But grace, uh, this is not saving grace, this is, this is a gift of grace, a spiritual gift of grace. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. <clears throat> in saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. <clears throat> he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until, and we want to really focus from right here to, the, uh, to verse 16, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up 
in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I love my children. I have, I have three girls. I even ha have one that's five years old, a very young daughter. And I'm sure that those of you who are parents love your children as well. And I'm sure that because you love your children so much, parents, you don't want to see them grow up. As, as they grow up and get older, it somewhat grieves you, and you wish they could stay little forever. But there will be something horribly wrong if when I am 80 years old, if I get there, and I don't anticipate that I will, but hypothetically, uh, if I was 80 years old and my youngest daughter, Charlie, was still five, and she still it was the physical size that she is now and was at that five-year-old point of mental development and, and 31 years in the future when I'm 80, that would be really bad, wouldn't it? Uh, we, we would say that there is something terribly wrong. Charlie is still at the maturity level of a five-year-old, and it's 2000, the year 2000 and what, 53 we would say there's something really wrong here with Charlie. She hasn't grown up. She hasn't matured. In verses 13 through 16, Paul shows us that a healthy church is marked by growth in spiritual maturity, growth in Christ's likeness. Notice Paul's emphasis on maturity in verse 13. Look at verse 13 again with me. <clears throat> Paul says, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to what? To mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So as individuals and as a church, we should always be seeking and moving steadily in a certain direction. What is that direction? Maturity in Christ, Christ's likeness. Uh, you know, you often say, uh, hear Christians say, I don't know what God's will for my life is. God's will for your life is that you become more like Jesus tomorrow and the next day and the day after that until you draw your last breath. The, the goal of the Christian life is not merely that we would say, I have fire insurance now. A worthy walk is one where we're constantly seeking maturity, seeking spiritual growth. Look at the last half of verse 15 where we see that emphasis. Paul says, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So the focus here is on spiritual maturity as a church. The goal of the Apostle Paul's ministry was not simply to see people converted. He wanted to see them go on to become mature, fruitful, God-glorifying, Christ-like believers. Listen to Colossians 1, 28 through 29, where Paul says this about the goal of his ministry and apostleship. He said, Christ we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Why, Paul? That we may present everyone mature in Christ. He said, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul said, I labor, I agonize, and I toil so that these churches that I planted won't be full of little baby Christians forever. Maturity is the goal of the Christian life. Uh, as we said, maturity is what? It's becoming like Jesus himself. Do you see this in verse 13? Paul says, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Maturity equals I'm more like Christ next week, next month, next year. We mature as we, the body, become more like Christ, the head. The goal of the Christian life, the goal of the church itself is to be as much like the Lord Jesus Christ as is possible. God is very interested in the spiritual maturity of His people. So churches in America, they're about one thing. Quantity, quantity, quantity. Jesus is about one thing. Quality, quality, quality. And so the question we want to ask of our text this morning is simple. How do Christians grow in maturity? How do Christians grow in maturity? I believe Paul gives us three answers in verses 13 through 16. The first answer is this, <clears throat> very simple, three words. We mature together. We mature together. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> Until we all, two short little words, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. For Christian people, growth, 
Christ-likeness, maturity does not happen in isolation. Paul's language here shows us that God's people grow in maturity collectively. We grow in maturity as a body. See that in verse 13? Until we all attain to mature manhood. Christian people become mature. Christian people become like Christ together. And that's the only way you're going to become like Christ is together in a faithful local church. In fact, the phrase mature manhood there in verse 13 is literally a mature man. Uh, the verse should read in this way, until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. That's what the Greek text says. Why does Paul say that Christians should be seeking to become a mature man instead of a bunch of mature men? Why does he put it that way? A mature man, he says, is what we're aiming for. Do you remember the phrase that Paul used in Ephesians 2 and 15 to describe the church uh, that was this new um, entity comprised of Jews and Gentiles? What, what did he call the church there in Ephesians 2.15? Do you remember? He said they're one new man, one new man in Christ. And now here in Ephesians 4.13, Paul is telling us that we are to become a mature man. This mature man, rather than mature men, is a corporate entity. A mature man is what we're shooting for. The mature man is the church as a whole being brought to maturity, not in isolation, but together. Christian people don't mature in isolation. If you want to be more like Jesus, it can only happen as you are deeply invested in a local church. We become a mature man together until we all attain to the unity of the faith. If you seek to become mature as a Christian apart from the church, you will find this, that no matter how old you get chronologically, you will be a babe in Christ your entire life. In the past couple of years, some of us have seen this painful truth played out in the lives of family members who have for decades uh, tried to be Christians and be rather aloof from the church. And then all of a sudden, there's this great moral failure that brings pain to the family. You think, How'd that person get to be that advanced in years and that childish? Well, they, they just kept dilly-dallying around the edge of the church and dropping in about once every month and doing their Christian thing on their own. And they remained babes in Christ. We've seen other folks who are quite advanced in years who consider themselves to be very spiritually mature. And yet they've lived aloof from the church for decades. And suddenly this massive immaturity manifests itself and hurts many people. You see, growth doesn't happen as I isolate myself and live my own little Christian life with a little dab of church sprinkled in here and there on the side when it's handy for me. Becoming like Jesus and growing up in the faith happens alongside other Christians as we all become a mature man together as the body of Christ. So if you are a Christian this morning who is not deeply invested in the life of a biblical church, you, if you continue that way, will be a babe in Christ a hundred years from now, if you live that long. We mature together. Look at verse 13 again. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Do you want to grasp, comprehend, understand the Christian faith? Do you want to know Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in a way, uh, such a way that He is real to you? If you want to mature in your head, and in your heart as a Christian person, if you want to understand sound doctrine and know the Lord Jesus in an intimate way, then you must be invested in a local church where the gifts of other Christians around you and the teaching of the leadership can help you to mature in your head and in your heart in sound doctrine and in your relationship with Jesus Christ to bring you to a mature man. We also have to grow in maturity together because God matures us as Christian people as we serve and minister to fellow believers. One of the ways that God destroys the selfishness that keeps us so immature all the time is He puts us in a church. He gives us gifts. He calls us to love these brothers and sisters. And He shows us how to lay our life down for those around us with those gifts. And in doing so, He withers that root of selfishness and immaturity in us. We become mature together. What if I told you that I was going to build the walls of this church? Now, this church has uh, masonry walls, cinder block walls with 
rock stuck to the outside. So we would need a lot of concrete, a lot of mortar, wouldn't we? Uh, what if I also told you that I'm going to build these walls, but I'm only going to use sand and water in my mortar mix? Well, those of you who know anything about building would say, look, Brent, that's not going to work because a mortar mix takes three ingredients, sand, water, and cement. It takes all these ingredients together to make a mix that could build the walls of this church. Now, as American Christians, we are often the proud fools that think we can build a mature Christian life while we leave out one of the important ingredients to maturity, which is what? The local church. Not just showing up every now and then, but knowing the people here and being known by the people here. That's what brings you to maturity. You've got to know people and you've got to be known by them. And if you're not willing to do that, you're just going to be a baby in Jesus forever. Well, how do we mature as Christians? One, we mature together. Two, two we mature through sound doctrine. We mature through sound doctrine. Look at verse 14. <clears throat> So that we may no longer be children. Children. Why is it so important that Christians grow in maturity? Because every single person, uh, no matter what age you're converted, if you're 100 years old and you come to Christ, you are immediately a baby in Christ. Uh, think about the imagery of being born again. Nobody is born as a mature adult. When we're born again, when, when our faith in Christ uh, uh, becomes real, and we come into the kingdom. We are babies. We're children. And so we have to mature. Children lack wisdom. And children make foolish choices. Children are gullible. And children are easily deceived. And all this makes children very vulnerable. Vulnerable to what, you might ask? Well, look at verse 14, the end of verse 14. Children are vulnerable to being tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Here's what they're vulnerable to. Look, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. It's a very dangerous thing to be spiritually immature, is it not? Because there are people all over the place teaching false doctrine, teaching half-truths, and doing so in the name of Jesus Christ. There are cunning, crafty, deceitful people out there teaching lies in the name of Jesus. And so if you go on in childlikeness and spiritual immaturity, one of those false teachers is going to pick you off. It's a dangerous thing to be immature in Christ. Listen to what the Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. He said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many False prophets have gone out into the world. There's not just a few here and there. There's many of these false prophets teaching false doctrine. Jesus himself said this. He gave this warning in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. He said, beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. But they look like they're peaceful, docile, harmless Christians. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous Wolves. False teachers creep in and they prey on immature, gullible, childlike Christians. And they say things like this. All religions are the same. They say things like this. All good people go to heaven. All good people go to heaven. The, the Bible is just one religious book among many religious books. They say that tr truth is not really important. What's important is that we're tolerant. Got, got to be tolerant. I read this on a Christian website this week. <clears throat> Listen to this. Th th this is how the false teachers speak. And it sounds so good. It sounds so right. Quote, I think we'll be okay on Judgment Day if we didn't get all the theology right. I do not think we will be okay if we fail to love others, work for justice, and show mercy. And the immature and the child are saying, yeah, that sounds right. And the mature are saying, that's works righteousness and that'll take you to hell. Dangerous, dangerous. There were many cunning, crafty deceivers teaching false doctrine, even in the New Testament times. Listen to Jude, verse 3 and 4. Jude, verse 3 and 4. 
Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. He says, Beloved, <clears throat> although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In other words, I wanted to write to you about our common salvation, but I had to write to you about sound doctrine instead. Why, Jude? For certain people have crept in unnoticed. <clears throat> Notice the stealthy language. <laughs> they creep in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So uh, in the church where Jude was a member, there were people who had come in, and they were basically teaching this. Because of God's grace, you can live like hell and still go to heaven. Or think about the opposite false doctrine that was being taught by false teachers in the church at Colossae. This is Colossians 2, 18 and 19. <clears throat> this is total opposite error, total opposite false teaching. Paul said, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism. Uh, asceticism is just severity to the body, okay? Insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. So there were people in Colossae who were saying, yes, faith in Jesus is good. That's nice. But you need to add to it if you want to grow in the Christian life. You need to be really severe to your body. You need to fast for weeks and weeks at a time. You may need to make sure you don't eat these certain foods and drink these certain drinks. Yes, Jesus is great, but you need to add a few things in. It's dangerous stuff. Dangerous stuff. Look at verse 14. Paul says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. So children are ignorant. And ignorance leads to what? Instability. Back and forth. Wishy-washy. Teetering and tottering everywhere. Immature Christian people are tossed to and fro by every fad that comes through the evangelical world. What is the latest teaching? What is the latest song on the radio by some unconverted somebody that claims to be a Christian artist? Children are always chasing the newest fad. The picture that Paul gives of this immaturity is that of a small boat in the middle of a vast ocean. Do you see it? Tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine. Imagine this little boat in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's got no rudder. It's got no mast, it's got no sail, and whichever way the wind and waves are blowing today, it's going that way. And if the wind and waves are blowing the opposite direction next day, it's going in the opposite direction. Wind and waves north, boats going north. Wind and waves south, boats going south. He said that's what immature Christian people are like. They're just everywhere. Whichever way the wind is blowing, they're headed that direction. No stability, no sense of direction, no forward progress. Christians who are not deeply grounded in sound doctrine are always wavering and always open to manipulation by the latest fad or idea. I mean, how on earth, how on earth do people get sucked in by these goofy preachers on the TBN network? I mean, you look at some guy on TBN and the guy's like wearing a white leather suit. And people wind up sending this guy all their money. How, how does stuff like that happen? I mean, you can see, you can see this guy's a, a huckster from outer space. And people send their life savings to people like this. How, how does that happen? How do people get sucked in by, uh, you, know, you know, you see that billboard in Nashville a few years ago, and it had this guy, uh, he had like a real short haircut, and he's blonde-headed. And it'd say, the apostle, Ron Carpenter. Uh, people, people going to the apostle, Ron Carpenter, and his church. How, how do people get sucked in by this stuff? How do people get sucked in by the prosperity gospel? Yes, you're a Christian. You, you follow Jesus. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and you're going to be rich and comfortable your whole life. How do people get sucked in by this stuff? How do people get sucked in by the woke church? By faith healers? How do people get sucked in by books like God and the Gay Christian by Matthew Vines? How do people get sucked in by books like Love Wins by Rob Bell? We're all going to heaven. Everybody is. How do people get sucked in by Mormons 
And Jehovah's Witness and this watchtower literature that's on the, the table at the dentist's office and lurking uh, for, to, to snare immature Christians. Behind these false teachers, there's a supernatural evil power that seeks to deceive immature believers with devilish cunning. Satan's scheming has a method. His aim is to mislead the immature who are not grounded in sound doctrine. You guys ever watch these uh, nature shows on TV? You know, there'll be caribou or some critter, reindeer, whatever, and they have their young, and the little one gets to lagging behind, and a grizzly bear just comes up and tears it all to pieces. You know, it just couldn't keep up, couldn't stay with the group. It was childish. It was goofing around behind, and it got picked off. The world is full of false teachers and false doctrine waiting to pick off immature Christians. Dangerous place to be. One of the marks of children is that they always prefer something that's exciting, uh, that's fun, <coughs> The, the newest thing, you know, I'll talk about my youngest daughter again who's five. If she's got a stuffed cat and Haley walks in the room with a stuffed dog, no more stuffed cat. It's time for the stuffed dog. <laughs> and then if Ivy walks in the room five minutes later with a stuffed zebra, no more stuffed dog. It's time for the stuffed zebra. Whatever the newest and latest thing is, Charlie's all about it because she is a child. Children are often too impatient to learn. They want to rush to the end of every lesson. They're, they're bored by the details. Children want to go to a church where there's a 20-minute life coaching session from the front. Children don't want to go to a church where somebody's going to stand up here for 45 minutes and give a detailed expository sermon. Immature Christians don't want to learn about doctrine. They want to delve into the latest fad in the evangelical world. The latest guru, the, the latest trend. They want a pastor who can entertain them. They want excitement. Children don't want a filling, uh, nutritious steak. Children want that lollipop that's the size of your head that you see at the carnival. That's what kids are after. That's what immature Christians are like. Hebrews 5, verse 11 to 14 talks about this. About this we have much to say and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. What are the marks of the mature? They've got discernment. They've had their powers of discernment trained to know good from evil. When you're a child and someone tells you something uh, from the pulpit or in a Christian magazine or a Christian podcast and it's 80% true and 20% false, when you're mature, you're like, there's something wrong with that. I smell it. I, I can't even put my finger on it. There's something off about it. But if you're, if you're immature, you listen to it and say, oh, that's great. I just gobbled that right down. That's exciting to me. Let me ask you this question. Are you seeking to grow in your understanding of sound doctrine alongside other Christians in a local church? That's what we're seeking to do here through expository preaching on Sunday morning. And then on Wednesday night, we get in groups and we talk about the sermon and we try to apply it to our life. And we're trying to grow as a church, corporately and individually, in sound doctrine so that we'll be deeply grounded in the great doctrines of the Word of God instead of being swept away by the latest fad to come through the evangelical world. You see, God has given evangelists and pastor teachers and fellow Christians in the local church so that we can grow in our knowledge of sound doctrine, in our knowledge of the truth. Okay, we want to know the truth. And in verse 15, Paul talks about the truth. Look at this, verse 15. He says, rather... Speaking the truth, the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So what word does verse 15 begin with? Rather, rather. Because verse 15 is meant to be a contrast to verse 14, okay? Verse 14, rather, and then verse 15 is basically the opposite of verse 14. In verse 14, you got deceit. Verse 15, you got truth. Verse 14, you got children. Verse 15, you got grown ups. Verse 14, you got cunning craftiness. And in verse 15, you got the opposite of that, which is 
love, love. Rather than being deceived like little children by the cunning of false teachers, we're to speak the truth to one another in love, and we are to grow up into Christ. Now, uh, speaking the truth in love, is there a more misused and abused phrase in all of the Christian world than the phrase speaking the truth in love. This phrase is basically used 100% of the time out of context in in evangelical circles. For Christian people, the phrase speaking the truth in love equals be nice. Be nice. That's totally not what Paul is saying here. What he's saying is this. You need to speak the truth in love instead of being a false teacher who's deceptive. Instead of deceptive and cunning, you need truth and love. And that's what we're to speak to one another. We're to grow in maturity as a church by proclaiming the truth to one another in love. Speaking the truth in love is not an expression that means be nice. It's an expression that means that we're we're to speak forthrightly with one another and not try to be cunning and deceiving any kind of sleight of hand. We're to be forthright with the truth. Paul wants all of us to be members of a confessing church with the content of our testimony being the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation. That's what speaking the truth in love is. It's this, forthright, no cunning, no deception. I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm not trying to get your money or anything. It doesn't mean, hey, be nice. Context helps, doesn't it? Speaking the truth in love does not mean that we timidly tippy-toe around with sound doctrine. It means that our motivation in speaking the truth is love for Christ, love for His church, love for one another, rather than a selfish, deceptive motive. It doesn't mean that we never say hard things that might offend people. For example, Paul spoke the truth in love in Galatians 2.11 to his good buddy, the Apostle Peter. Listen to how he spoke the truth in love to Peter. Galatians 2.11 says, But when Cephas, or Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. That's speaking the truth in love. That's getting in your apostle buddy's face and saying, look, you're a hypocrite. You were eating with these Gentile Christians before because they were in Christ and they were your brothers. And here come these Jewish guys that say you're supposed to be circumcised too and now you've drawn back. Is it about Christ or is it about circumcision, Peter? You need to stop. That's speaking the truth in love. In order to grow in maturity, we have to show love toward one another by defending the truth, practicing the truth, and even saying hard truths to one another. Let me ask you this. Are you willing to defend the truth? Are you willing to live in line with the truth? Are you willing to say hard things to fellow Christians that you know they're not particularly going to like in order that they might grow up in Christ? Are you willing to hear a hard truth and not get mad at the person who said it and see it as an act of love so that you yourself might grow up in Christ? Well, how do Christians grow in maturity? One, we, uh, we mature together. Two, we mature through sound doctrine. And thirdly, and briefly, and finally, we mature as each one contributes. We mature as each one contributes. Do you see this in verse 16? <coughs> verse 16 says, From whom whom being Christ, from Christ the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly. Makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So Christ is the one who gives the growth. He makes the church, the body, grow and progress toward maturity. But He has ordained that the church would grow by His power in a certain way, when certain conditions are met. Christ has ordained that we grow to maturity in Him as a body when each part is working properly. Do you see that in verse 16? When each part is working properly. In other words, we will only grow as each member actively contributes to the growth of the whole body with whatever spiritual gifts that God has given to you for the upbuilding of His church. And so again, we see this corporate aspect of becoming mature in Christ. Uh, it, It is basically a community project to become a mature Christian as each part is working properly. Paul speaks of us being joined together there in verse 16 as a body. Uh, He talks about uh, uh, joints coming together. Think of a shoulder joint. 
with, with its ball and socket design. Fits together perfectly. No friction there. Uh, uh, no burrs. That, that's how it's supposed to be in the body of Christ. We're supposed to use our gifts in a seamless way and walk in the gifting that God has given us and cooperate and maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace so that we can build one another up. We're a body. We're joined together. We are very much dependent upon one another if we are to mature in the faith. There's an interconnectedness to the body of Christ. Do you see this in verse 16? From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint. That's some intimate language. There is an interconnectedness to the body of Christ. The growth of the whole is bound up in the welfare of every individual Christian. When each part is working properly, Christ makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. If you don't use your spiritual gifts, my maturity will be stunted. If I don't use mine, yours will be stunted. The progress of the whole is bound up in the welfare of every part. The development of the whole is interrupted when there's a defect in any part because there's an organic unity to the body of Christ in a local church. Verse 16, we are joined and held together by every joint with which we are equipped. You know, if you develop a, an acute infection in the very tip of your little finger, you'll eventually become sick all over, will you not? If it goes on and it's left untreated, you'll start getting headaches, you'll start feeling sick to your stomach, you may even get gangrene in your finger. It might spread all the way down your arm. If it goes on and on, it could kill you. And it's just a little infection in the end of your fing finger. Every single member of the church is vitally important. Every single member of the church is vitally important. Are you contributing to the health and growth and edification of the body with the gifts and the resources and the life that God has given to you? Uh, my growth depends on it. Our spiritual growth as a church depends on it. Uh, you know, my, uh, Sandra sent uh, my wife and I a text about six weeks ago. And it so perfectly illustrated an understanding of what Paul is talking about in verse 16 that I actually copied it and pasted it in my Bible software beside this verse. So I'm going to quote Sandra here, okay? <laughs> she sent this text to Amanda and I. She said this. Uh, this is indicative of somebody who understands these verses. We hadn't even got to them yet, Sandra, and you, and you understood it. Good for you. She says this, quote, I have reflected on how I need different individuals in the church and how God is growing me through his work in them. She said, God is growing me through his work in other people in the church. She said this, I need to see Janet's perseverance as God has preserved her through some really hard things. I need to hear Michael Collins' thoughts as he processes God's word deeply in a completely different way than I do. I need to be encouraged by Joyce's steadfast faithfulness in practical service. I need to be encouraged by Amanda's prayerfulness and compassion for others. I need to be encouraged by Christian's careful, reflective listening. I need to be encouraged by Ivy's spiritual growth as I've watched her over the last six years. I need to be encouraged by Rebecca McClure's and Lene's heart to give. I need to be encouraged by Michael Watson's boldness in evangelism. I am beyond humbled and grateful. That's somebody that gets it. <laughs> Unfortunately, most people who identify as Christians in this country, they totally do not get it. When each part is working properly, Christ makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And so God's goal for us as Christian people is Christ-likeness. It is maturity. We grow to maturity how? Together. We grow to maturity through sound doctrine and speaking the truth to one another in love. We grow to maturity as each one uses his or her gifts to build up the body of Christ. May God give us the grace to mature together into uh, not necessarily mature men, but to a mature man. Let's pray. Father, we're reminded and we're grateful that part of the good news is that we've become part of the body of Christ, that we're now part of something that's bigger than ourselves. It's not just that our sins are forgiven 
And it's forgiven me over here by myself in a corner waiting to go to glory, but you've made us part of your body, part of your bride, part of your church. And every member of that church is vitally important. Teach us, Lord, to view our Christian life through a biblical lens and not from a pop culture, individualistic, 21st century American lens. Forgive us for our pride, where we think we don't need other people and we're doing fine. Lord, we're just as dependent on our brothers and sisters in Christ in many ways as we are on Christ himself. Lord, give us love for your church. Give us love for those who are blood-bought, and thank you that you bought us with your blood, Jesus. Help us to go on to maturity, Lord, where there's childishness in me. Continue to eradicate it. Uh, Where there's uh, wrong beliefs, Lord, in our heart, continue to show us the truth, to turn from those false beliefs. And uh, where our hearts, Lord, are set on serving self and sin, continue to wither those desires in us and help us grow up into the head who is Christ. We ask it in his name. Amen. Ivy's going to play two verses. You go to the Lord in prayer, prepare your heart to take communion. come to the Lord's table, let me again remind you that this is a holy meal. It is a sacred meal. The Lord's table is for baptized believers in Jesus Christ who rested all their hope on the death of Jesus to take away sin, the life of Jesus to be our righteousness. If you're not yet a baptized believer, you should refrain from partaking of these elements until you have repented, been baptized, and come into the church. The Lord's table is for saved sinners. That's what we all are as Christian people. But if you're harboring any unrepentant sin in your heart, we ask that you would make that right with the Lord before you partake of these elements. These elements proclaim to us the love of Christ, his blood shed for our sin, his body broken for us. When you're ready, you may come.
just hours before Jesus went to the cross as he ate his last meal with his disciples before that event. In Matthew chapter 26, he said this, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand and sing, There is one gospel. <clears throat>